Sophisticated, cosmopolitan, worldly, elegant, and beautiful, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy transformed the image of a First Lady and quickly became an essential part of the political life and image that was John F. Kennedy. Most people today, when they consider politicians, tend to see politicians in a wider context. What I mean is they, they're not just voting for this person. Uh, very often they, they want to see this person in context of family, roots, uh, wife and kids. And I'm not going to say or suggest that that is a legacy John Kennedy started, but there is no question that in John Kennedy's career, whatever course it would take, but certainly in politics, one of the elements that was just absolutely critical and essential was his marriage to Jacqueline. Uh, the image of that young couple was the uh, <laughs> was uh, everywhere. I mean, every magazine, every TV. I mean, this is on air all the time. She was beautiful. She was elegant. She was intelligent. Uh, a perfect partner to John Kennedy and what he looked like, young, smart, uh, from an elegant background. I mean, they were a perfect match of, of young America, elegant America that people really took to. Pleasure to have you here, and I want you to meet my daughter, Caroline, and uh, my wife, uh, Jackie. How do you do? I'm glad you had a chance to see something in the Senate, and now to see our house where we've lived a year, and since Caroline was born. And I look forward to meeting all of you this fall as soon as the Senate is out, and we'll be back in Massachusetts. But things were not all they appeared. Along with her husband regularly stepping outside the marriage, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy experienced many personal tragedies. In 1956, Jackie had a miscarriage, and then only a year later gave birth to a stillborn. In 1963, just three months before her husband's death, she gave birth to a son, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, who died just two days after being delivered by an emergency C-section. Americans at that time weren't particularly known for other languages, which is much more common nowadays. Uh, and somebody who could speak another language, was there was kind of a cachet to that. And somebody in politics speaking another language was really kind of uh, unusual. And, and those are those little intangibles uh, that today would be missed, but at that time were very conspicuous and only enhanced the image and elevated their status. Que no hay esposa, ni madre, ni padre, ni familia en este continente que pueda conformarse hasta que los habitantes de todos nuestros pueblos tengan oportunidades de trabajo bien remunerados. Pueden vivir recientemente y, y recibir enseñanza. Estas cosas deberían estar al alcance de todos y no limitarse a unos pocos afortunados. And, and campaign trails when John Kennedy would, you know, share the stage with Jackie and she'd come on stage, everything got even better. I mean, it wasn't a diminution at all. She was part of the team. And if she spoke Spanish, even better or French. I mean, John Kennedy brought her along with good reason. She was a very helpful person for his political career. Jacqueline had a huge influence on the fashion and taste of the early 1960s. And she and Jack, along with the two children, Caroline and John Jr., became a popular feature of magazine photo spreads. In 1962, when Jackie decided to redecorate the White House, to better reflect her taste, she gave a televised tour of the remodel. The tour was considered must-watch television and later that year won her an Emmy Award.
There are many historians today that tell you that if John Kennedy had lived and had uh, run and won his re-election bid in 1964 for presidency, he might have been in a wheelchair. That is shocking to most people. Uh, they don't have uh, much idea about how the image of John Kennedy, of him being robust and energetic and healthy, and anybody who lived during the 1960s would tell you they remember all those photographs of uh, a healthy John Kennedy playing football, John Kennedy lifting his son, John Jr. Of course, we now know so many things about that that were then kept very secret. This is a young man through all of his life really dealt with physical issues and health problems. And those things were all very uh, secret. And quite frankly, the public wasn't particularly nosy about many of those things. And certainly the journalists at the time wouldn't be too concerned about that. There was a kind of, of ethic among journalists to not pry into some of these areas. So let's say if John Kennedy were running for office today, and we knew half of the things we know about his health, his reliance on prescription drugs or non-prescription drugs, uh, the fact that he suffered from Addison's disease, which is a potentially fate, fatal disease, it would have been very difficult for John Kennedy to run for president. Those health issues alone would have been a very big impediment. But at the time, those were not known. Um, and many of the things that made him look young and vibrant were in fact uh, side effects of the massive amount of daily injections he received uh, for the multiple problems that affected his physical well-being. You know, it's even argued, of course, that even that tragic day in Dallas, that um, uh, had he not been wearing the back brace, you know, it's possible, you know, and these are all just speculations, but it's possible that, you know, after being hit with the first bullet, he could have fallen. Uh, but the fact that the back brace kind of kept him up, kept him in the line of fire of the assassin. If, if somebody were loose or uh, not careful or reckless in their private life, they would be setting themselves up uh, for a tremendous uh, surprise. And this is in the area of John Kennedy's life, which did com compromise is the right word, to compromise so much of his actions because there was so much he had done that J. Edgar Hoover knew about and other people knew about. Uh, and uh, mafia people knew about, and their connections in other you know, circles. And if that word got out, I mean, they had to hide stuff. And Kennedy's youthful, uh, promiscuous ways, um, I mean, one historian said that Kennedy was more promiscuous with drugs than he was with women. And that's a profound statement when you consider how promiscuous he was with women. The fact that he would have affairs with uh, uh, foreign women and the suggestion that those might be uh, communist plants uh, and information might be got, or they'd just be used to uh, embarrass John Kennedy. Uh, he had to be leashed in on many occasions because of uh, the recklessness of his personal life. Uh, John Kennedy uh, kept his affairs uh, all throughout his presidency. Um, Jackie Kennedy was his wife. Jackie Kennedy was the mother of his children. Jackie Kennedy was part of the whole Camelot image that America loved. And that's what America wanted to know about. But the boys club that went on, uh, whether it be uh, with the Rat Pack uh, and his associations with Frank Sinatra, and uh, this is a side of John Kennedy's life that uh, wasn't known at the time and wouldn't have been reported on at the time, but is widely known today. It's unavoidable when you think about John Kennedy as a person, and then John Kennedy as a person and as a politician. You have to factor in his cognizance, his awareness of his mortality, 
and 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 maybe that played into and I, I'll be a psycho historian here but the 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 recklessness with which he lived, the bravado with which he lived, the urgency with which he lived, um, that that all fed into that. In Texas and the nation, change has been the law of life. Growth has meant new opportunities for this state. Progress has meant new achievements. And we dare not look back now. In 1990, the age of space will be entering its second phase. And our hopes in it to preserve the peace, to make sure that in this great new sea, as on Earth, the United States is second to none. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions, the Bible tells us. And where there is no vision, the people perish. When people nowadays look back on the presidency of John Kennedy, uh, the, 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 the way he died is just, you know, just so horrific, so tragic for anybody but the United States president to be uh, murdered in broad daylight uh, in Texas. Um, and, you know, and the consequences of that. I remember as, as a kid in school, everybody sent home and cry, everybody's crying and it was unbelievable. But, you know, why was Kennedy even there? And uh, the truth of the matter is that, you know, he was campaigning. He's going to you know, be running for re-election. And uh, the Democratic Party was not all that unified. And Texas is a big state. Texas is a big Democratic state, or it was then, and it has a lot of electoral votes. And it was important and it's vital for Kennedy to shore up his base and support in the South and in Texas. And uh, the relationship between uh, Texas Democrats was not very warm. So for multiple important and pressing uh, political reasons, you know, John Kennedy was going to travel south and go to Texas and deliver uh, some key speeches, but also working behind the scenes to, you know, get people together in the party uh, to support him for his reelection bid. And that's the, the circumstances that will bring him, unbeknownst, of course, into Dealey Plaza on his way to make a, a speech and uh, to be uh, assassinated, um, allegedly by Lee Harvey Oswald. And again, you know, you'll, we'll never know ultimately that, I suppose, either because of uh, Oswald's uh, subsequent uh, killing, you know, a couple days later by Jack Ruby, never standing trial um, and never really having a courtroom evidence uh, hearing about that. Now going past me, the limousine is now traveling at a very high rate of 
these secret service men standing up in the limousine. They are armed with submachine guns. It appears as though someone in the limousine might have been hit by the gunfire. Put me on, Phil. Put me on. Hello, my on. We're here at the trademark. The motorcade is coming by here. I can see many, many motorcycles coming by now. Police motorcycles. Just heard a call on the radio for all units along industrial to pick up the motorcade. Something has happened here. We understand there has been a shooting. The presidential car coming up now. We know it's the presidential car. You see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. There's a Secret Service man spread eagle over the top of the car. We understand Governor and Mrs. Connolly are in the car with President and Mrs. Kennedy. We can't see who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. I'm in behind the motorcade trying to follow them. It looks as though they're going to Parkland Hospital. We're on the road too far for the best time. The Secret Service man is still spread eagle over whoever is in the car, the President and Mrs. Kennedy, and as we understand, Governor and Mrs. Connolly. At this point, it looks as though it could have been one or two or even all of the people within the car may have been the victims, may have been struck by shots. We don't know. Hoffman Hospital in the distance. Now on Harry Hines Boulevard, following behind the motorcade. Many, many police officers, maybe 20 or 25 motorcycle policemen, falling in behind the trademark. And here's car left behind, waiting expectantly to see the president. The motorcade now, motorcade now perhaps, two or three blocks ahead of me. They're approaching the entrance now to Parkland Hospital, traveling at a high rate of speed. Already police cars converging on Parkland from every angle, from every point. I'm pulling in now towards Parkland Hospital, coming to the approach. There's an officer waving me down. He's waving me around. There's a cordon. There's already a cordon of police officers running from their cars. From their vehicles here, the official party, as I can see it, pulling around toward the emergency room of Parkwood Hospital. The policeman says, no, you cannot come in here. You cannot come in here. We'll let nobody else in. It was definitely the president's car. We can see the first lady's paint suit. That's the only identification we could see, but we know it is the president's car. Another car directly behind the presidential car. There were also bodies in that car. Another Secret Service man spread eagle over them. We don't know. Perhaps there were some hit in that car as well. We're not sure. Yeah, the first unconfirmed reports say the president was hit in the head. That's an unconfirmed report that the president was hit in the head. Just a moment. Just a moment. We have a bulletin coming in. We now switch you directly to Parkland Hospital and KBOX News Director Bill Hampton. The president of the United States is dead. I have just talked to Father Oscar Hubert of the Holy Trinity Catholic Church. He and another priest tell me that the pair of men have just administered the last rites of the Catholic Church to President Kennedy. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. When the president was shot, it, it seemed almost like the army didn't know what to do. Or, matter of fact, nobody knew what to do exactly. And I don't think there was that much of a feeling of uh, danger than there was in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I suppose that's understandable, but wow, it just didn't seem like we were able to do anything but stand there and watch and get troops ready in Washington for, for formal ceremonial kinds of things. This is a sad time for all people. We have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. For me, it is a deep personal tragedy. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. I will do my best. That is all. I can do. I ask for your help and God. It was it was a very just incredible how profound it was. I I was talking to a couple similarly aged folks today about the Kennedy time and I I postulated that it it's possible even 9-11 in some ways didn't have as profound an impact at, as 
as the assassination did. I'm not sure I can explain that particularly, but it really was so just like nobody, almost impossible to believe. feel shattered and helpless in the face of our loss. This is but natural, but as the first bitter pangs of our incredulous grief begins to pass, we must thank God that we were privileged, however briefly, to have had this great man for our president, for he has now taken his place among the great figures of world history. In today's world where violence is seemingly, you know, rampant and movies are full of gore, it's difficult to, again, go back and understand how horrific the events of November 22nd really were. And the, the filming, of uh, Zabruder's film of the, the murder of John Kennedy, or of anybody for that matter, in broad daylight, and such a horrible murder was was so repulsive and so gory and, and, uh, and, um, and really almost obscene that you wouldn't look at that kind of thing. And when Life magazine even showed some of the still photos, they kept the real graphic ones out. You know, why would you show that kind of stuff? I mean, the public wasn't ready for that then. It was a horrific death, and it was a martyrdom. It was a tragic end to a very short presidency, full of event. Obviously, that is going to affect the way people saw John Kennedy's presidency. And without question, in the first years after his death, all of those historical polls or salon games, he was rated high in the top five. That is no longer the case. There's been a, a much uh, closer and cooler consideration of John Kennedy's presidency. John F. Kennedy uh, remains perhaps the greatest uh, symbol that we have in the history of our country of a young president, uh, a young president who takes office uh, at a time uh, when uh, the torch is passing to a new generation, as he said. Uh, the, the people who would have been elected in the New Deal and uh, throughout World War II were from an older generation. And he, the legacy of John Kennedy is really one of vigor, viga, as he used to say, vigor and energy and idealism and commitment to a better America, uh, to a better opportunity for people who uh, were excluded, especially people of color to better opportunity for uh, people who are living uh, in poverty. Uh, there's much more to the, the Kennedy legacy, uh, for sure. Some things still uh, under close scrutiny still stand up, and I think in those areas you look, say, at the space program, I think that still remains sort of unsullied and a great testimony to John Kennedy's bold rhetoric. One thing about John Kennedy, because he his uh, time was cut so short, and he was only a president for less than three years, uh, is uh, the concrete results didn't happen that would have happened. Uh, and so what he gets credit for concretely is having started so many things that then happened down the road. But I think we remember him most uh, for uh, the sense of idealism, for the sense of the possible. Uh, what we can be, uh, fulfilling the American dream through that sort of leadership and that sort of uh, energy, I think that's the greatest part of his le legacy.